Forensic anthropology is the examination of human skeletal remains. It can find out the identity, interpret trauma, and estimate time since death. Who better to talk to me about the ins and outs than Carrie Ann Millich? She really has seen it all. Why is forensic anthropology so important? It's human identification, basically. What we're trying to establish is the biological profile of an individual. So it can help in criminal cases, but my business has mainly been in uh, management of the deceased, dead bodies, mass disasters, and human identification on a mass scale. So in um, disaster DVI situations, disaster victim identification situations, although forensic anthropology doesn't directly contribute to the, it's not one of the primary standards for identification. Uh, those primary standards are fingerprints, DNA and odontology, which is dentition. It doesn't directly contribute to that, but indirectly it allows those professions to be able to get to where they need to be. So we can, for example, oh, I could talk about this all day. Um, <laughs> for example, in a mass disaster situation, um, we will be used, not necessarily, we'll be used to sort the remains. So it's locating the remains. We can help with the location and recovery of the remains, whereas a lot of people that would be in the field may not be versed or experienced in recognising what human remains would look like in certain situations, burnt, commingled, fragmented. And it's that in situ, those remains in situ can tell us a lot. And if someone's just collecting them all up, and putting them in one big bag, you lose the association of those remains and then everything needs to be tested. So having a forensic anthropologist in the field for recovery is very, very important. Um, but it's not all, not all is lost if there isn't. We can do a lot at, for example, in mass disaster situations, you often have triage. So as the remains come in, the forensic anthropologist will sort through and see First of all, is it human? If it's not human remains, then is it going to be significant? Not usually. We're looking for the pieces of human that we're trying to identify so that ultimately we can give the body, identify those people and give the bodies back to their families to be put to rest. Um, also, forensic anthropologists will be able to identify the body parts that would have forensic significance. So is there going to be a, a DNA, is DNA going to be possible um, from this burnt piece of tissue, or would it be positive? You know, if it's not going to have any forensic significance, then we'll move on. We don't don't need to waste the um, resources. So there's no point testing everything. There's usually guidelines that are set at the beginning. And as I say, it's um, really management of the disease. So we have a big part to play in the big picture, if you like, rather than just oh, let's get the establish the sex the age of the individual when they died and things like that. Yes, we can do that, but it, ultimately we're contributing to the identification of the people involved in an incident. I mean, disaster management obviously is really important now and unfortunately so uh, since, you know, 9-11 it's been taken off. Obviously when we watch like shows like, let's go for CSI, I'm always throwing that on in there, they have one person that can do everything, but you know, Actually, finding those bits that you just said in situ or even finding what is bone, what isn't, what's human, what's not, is actually very like, specialised, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, once you need a lot of experience, you need to be able to recognise what, what is human bone and what is not human bone. Especially, it can be very difficult, especially when they're fragmented and commingled in cases such as um, the 9-11 or massive plane crash huge impacts um, will fragment the bones and also I mean I was working in um, Bosnia for six years um, identifying people from the mass graves and they were highly commingled highly fragmented and it was thought that their DNA wouldn't be DNA identification wouldn't be possible but we managed to piece together the people from multiple mass graves so that we can get as much of the that individual as pers as possible to return to the families and the families can put them to rest. Now it's we don't need a lot of equipment really. The over the last 10 years, 15 years, yes, it's become very popular and people are much more aware of it. And it is a relatively new field. It wasn't until 1970s or something that it really became um 
a forensic discipline or a discipline at all. So the fact that now there's a lot of courses and a lot of universities and people are so interested in it. And also it's really important that the police are aware and they are now, they do have training courses and that they are trained in recognizing human remains, but ultimately someone who has the qualifications and has the experience is going to be much more useful to someone. It's always, it looks like a bone, it looks like a bone, but what's it from? You know, so it's, um, but technology these days has improved our abilities because now we don't need to be at the scene we can actually look at a picture of a bone or digital image of a bone and be able to say yes it's human or no it's not um, really for me i prefer to actually feel the bone there's a lot of things that you look at and you need to to be able to feel um, in order to make our best estimations particularly for age estimations and I think that it must be quite satisfying that if you know, even though you can look at, say, a dig, an archaeological dig, and give those like you know, age, gender, but the fact that you can actually give people the hope and being able to like bury their loved ones must be quite satisfying in that kind of field. It it really is. It's it's such important work, and I think that death has always been in our culture has always been a very taboo subject. And I don't think that people talk about it enough. And then when people ha do have someone that's missing or someone that's been involved, family member that's been involved in an incident and they can't find them or they can't identify them, it, it, I can't even imagine how, what they must be going through. And I feel that it's so important for the families to get that loved one back to them so that they can move on. Um, not forget, not closure, just move on and, you know, they know they have some sort of answers and they're able to put them to rest. They have a physical place to actually go and see them, remember them if they need that sort of thing. We can help with the repatriations as well. Um, that's really important when people die abroad. Um, people don't know what to do if they're, you know, mum and dad go on holiday and then something happens to them while they're out there. How do they get them back? So that's another massive stress for the family. They're already, already dealing with a deceased person, um, family member, and no one, it, it's really, really difficult. It's more difficult to move a dead person from one country to another than it is a live person who, for example, has Ebola. You know, it's, it's really, really difficult. And so that's what my actual company does um, is, to help with the repatriations and also we care for the people that don't have any family left that need public health funerals, who don't have anyone to, the council is responsible for paying for their funerals. So we um, deal with those because it's really important, I think, that someone remembers them. I, mean, that's, I would never have thought about repatriation. When, you, when I hear that term, I always think about like the armed forces and you're coming home with like a gun salute. But just to think that if your family member died abroad, you wouldn't think where to go. Yeah, there's a lot of paperwork involved. Um, but we just take the stress away from the families because there's no written guidelines anywhere. Um, different countries require different documents. Getting those documents can be easier in some countries than the other in, than others. It depends on where the person's died and where they're going back to. Um, We've dealt with all sorts of things in the past, particularly also for plane crashes where you have you can have 13, 14, 15 different nationalities on board. And perhaps some of them will be going, although they might be one nationality, their family is from a different country. And so they're going to be buried in yet another place. So then there's different paperwork and stamps and all sorts of things that are required. But also it's identifying them. Are they free from infection? Are they... Can, you know what even before you get to that point in a disaster situation you need to make sure that you have that person in the coffin you know you don't want to be put in different countries have different standards so it's really important that they're they are up to the standards if they're coming back to the UK it might be that the coroner would order another autopsy or in order to actually make sure that yes this is that person there's nothing no other bits from anybody else popped in there because can you can you imagine the horror for the families and having to re-exhume yet again their loved ones so 
it's, it needs to be very precise. Yeah, it needs to be. It, you can't. There is no room for mistake in this sort of this sort of field because. I mean, like you've got you've got a whole like different like. People. Yeah, well, you've got different hands, have you? It's like obviously you're coming from this, the crime scene, taking it all the way through to actually being face to face with the survivors or the family members. That's. Uh, a whole different psychologic psychology behind forensic anthropology that I mean did you even know that that was going to happen when you started doing the course all those years ago? I did a forensic science to start off with I originally wanted to be a vet oh. um, yeah I know it was, then it was when the vets in practice or something like that became really popular on tv and then suddenly the entrance grades to university just went up to A's and A stars and it's really competitive and then I just thought, my mum got me look into these uh, Patricia Cornwall books, actually, oh. with Kay Scarpetta, the forensic pathologist. And I thought, oh, that's a bit of me, that is really. I think uh, I could be quite interested in that. Forensic science, quite varied. And um, it was in my final year that I had uh, my teacher, um, Corinne Duhigg, was a forensic anthropology lecturer. And she showed us about some of her work she'd dealt with and her casework. And I just thought I need to, I want to identify people from plane crashes. That for me was what I wanted to do. And then, so I thought, right, I'm going to do a master's degree in forensic anthropology. I went to Bradford University for that. And whilst I was there, there was an advert up for a mass disaster organisation that were holding an open day. And so I went and uh, just took my CV with me and handed it to one of the the host there and then they invited me to a training event at Gatwick Airport three days and I just loved it and I've been with them ever since that was in 2004 I think um until recently I've been a team member I was even um I was an associate a team member and I was director of operations full-time for them for two years and I've been all over the world responding first responder to many disasters terrorist attacks um fires um mass mass fatality events, a lot of plane crashes, mm. and many different roles, um, usually organising the big picture, making sure people are doing the right thing, that we can liaise with the clients, um, and basically, ultimately, identifying the individuals, getting them back to their loved ones. So I loved every minute of it, and I, I do miss it, definitely. But now you have your own company, don't you? So you're stepping out and say so you're doing repatriations and you're also helping with that still kind of helping with the disaster management side of it but doing your own thing yes absolutely yeah it's time for me to step on my stand on my own two feet and uh i just want to help i just want to help people and help the deceased now don't forget to subscribe to bedroom forensics you can get all the latest lessons as well as what's new in the world of product and tech make sure you subscribe